I think I'm here. This is how distracted I've been this morning. I realize as we're finishing that song that I had no microphone on. I had to run back. Roy, would you open up this time in prayer for me? I think so. I put him on the mic. Jeff, sorry. Lord, when you departed this, this earth, you promised to send your spirit. Lord, Lord you spirit is in all of us who believe. So right now, Lord, I pray that you would send that spirit to be to the mightily. Lord, first the prayer for him. Ask you, Lord, to free him, keep him, that would take away any boldness and proof. Sin, sin is real, and it isn't real. Lord, that causes me to have to pray and want to pray for us personally. Open our hearts with that spirit. Our minds to that spirit. Let us see, Lord, proof of that sin that you have. That even we to walk. In doing that truth, Lord, in that truth for every person, pray, Lord, that you truth about Christ. What that means is the word to rejoice, the recognition that you, you would be glorified. Let that message recognize closer to you. You do it. You will. Amen. I honestly wanted to start off the week as soon as I saw the text and I started reading it over and over. I was going to just mail it in and email the text to you and say, good luck, guys. <laughs> really. <laughs> you might want to open your Bibles to Mark uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to use, I'm going to use a driving illustration because I realized if, I think if I used any other ish, illustrations of sin, um, we'd probably have a hard time communing together um, after today. But have you guys ever noticed how um, when you're on the freeway, we'll, we'll use the freeway, it's the safest place that we're all tempted, um, but we're on, when you're on the freeway and the speed limit says, I don't know, 70, um, how many of you set your cruise control to 75? Okay. How many of you set it to 74. Yeah, yeah, there's a few of you out. You, you guys are a little closer to Jesus, obviously. <laughs> here's, here's the thing that I find really interesting. How many of you, when you get out there and you intend to set it at 75 and four or five cars go by you like you're sitting still, you bump it up to 77 or 78 because you're like, well, they're going to get nailed before me, <laughs> right? Some of you are little sinners. I know it because I'm, I'm one of you. Isn't it interesting how greatly impacted we are by the circumstances in that moment? We came out intending to only break the law by five miles an hour. Let that sink in for just a minute. But because other people were going faster, we felt compelled to continue our spiral downward. Now you guys know my Christian uh, philosophy is that, you know, the, the law enforcement offers, officers clearly allow us to go five over, so we're, I'm okay with that. I'll let you deal with your own issues of sin on that particular issue. 
But when we get to talk about sin, and that's what we're looking at today in Mark chapter 9, the, the tendency for us, I think, as Christians is to see how close to the edge we can get before we're affected by it. Right? I mean, how, how many of us, that's how we evaluate this. It's, it's we look at it and we're like, well, okay, if I'm, am I in sin now? No? Okay. What about now? Am I, am I in sin yet? Uh, well, what about now? And, and that's, that's how we approach sin. That's how we approach, I, I think, unfortunately, it's how we approach the holiness of God then as well. That we somehow think it's a balancing act. It's something that we can, that we can engage in and... And I, I, honestly, I wish it was a balancing act because then we could measure it out, right? We'd be like, well, I had three sins that were of this caliber today, so now i got to do the three acts that are of this caliber today, and I'm fine. Wouldn't it be nice if he let us have that? Um, I've, another illustration I was thinking about just this morning, I've been watching the, the, the biathlon cross-country skiing insane people. I don't know if you've seen these people, but they go out and they, they get on cross-country skis and they race around a loop with a, with a 22 on their back, and then they drop down and they have to shoot laying down a couple times and they shoot standing up and they're running around. I mean, it just looks terribly painful. But one of the things that I noticed about their, the, the target practice or the target shooting spot is that the circle's pretty small. And if they miss, they take a penalty loop. There's, there's, no, there's, no, like, there's no point rings on it. I don't know how many of you shoot, but we, we have targets, we have point rings, you know, the cl- closer you get. You just feel better about yourself if you're inside the big circle, even if you didn't hit the bullseye, right? It's kind of how we function. Um, and, and with this, there isn't, it's just this little tiny spot. And it doesn't matter if they nick the edge of it. If it doesn't hit the center, the center tang and it doesn't go off, they take a penalty loop. And normally it ends up costing them time. And I thought to myself, is that how I see sin? Am, am I taking a penalty loop when I miss God's view of sin? Jesus is going to take his disciples through this discussion today uh, in Mark. And I, I want to I share with you that this passage of Mark, it's one of the unique times where Mark kind of takes several different stories that kind of all point to the same thing, and he combines a couple of different passages that we actually see in Matthew and Luke. So it's, there, this is more than one moment of teaching. Mark's actually uh, uh, clumped a couple of things together here to make his point. Um, and based on our time restraints, in my own ability to, to wrestle with this this week, we're probably going to spend a couple weeks on this. Yay! Are you guys excited about that sin for a few weeks? This has been an incredibly good week for me. Incredibly good week. Because in the midst of a culture... that at some level is suffering from fear. Some rightly so, some not, not so much. The ability to be distracted, the ability to get our eyes off of what's important is huge. What have you spent your time talking about this week? Has it been your Bible reading? Mine hasn't. Some of you got stuck having to listen to me deal with this passage because you were stuck in proximity to me. But the reality is is that I'm easily distracted. I easily get my eyes off of what's important. And I think when it comes to the issues of sin, we have done such an incredibly good job of this. Let's look at what Mark says in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. 
And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. The first thing that we see in the text is that Jesus is, is pointing the disciples' eyes back to these little ones. Re- remember that last week we talked about how these little ones are received, and, and we actually looked at the way that Jesus talks about that is that we're supposed to take care of them and receive them, and, and that those who receive them and even offer them a cup of cold water, their reward will not be lost. Uh, in fact, one of the texts compared it to how we receive a, a prophet or how we receive a rich, rich person or how we receive a little one. In not referencing children specifically, but illustrating their need or their lack of importance through the illustration of children, which, again, we don't really understand that in our culture, do we? Because kids are pretty important in this culture. They, they take a high value in our culture. Uh, do any of you guys remember the seen and not heard motto? Come on, a few of you kids have to have heard that. Your parents... I, well, I, I shared that with my boys regularly. Seen and not heard. Sort of. The reality is, is that the, the idea of children was that they were, they were really not that important to the family structure. I think partly because many of them would die. The, the, the medical coverage that we have now is so much different. So many kids that would have never survived birth not even probably 60, 70 years ago, today survive and, and, and live. So there, there's a value system. But what Jesus is pointing to here is this idea of causing others to sin. Now, the word for sin in, in the Greek is actually to cause to stumble here. There's other parts where we see sin is missing the mark, um, and there's several other uh, you know, tr- there's translations um, that we that we can use to to cut up the word. But the key point in this text is not being the one that causes someone else to stumble or sin. That we are called not to be the cause. Do we ever do that? I know for a fact I've done it. In fact, if if my uh, not too many years ago, I would, have, I would have had a significant altercation with my bride probably over this weekend because our, our communication systems are a little better than they used to be. And I am learning her value. And I'm, I'm learning that there are times where When I don't see the value, I need to remind myself of her value instead of arguing with her about my opinion. Right? Because I can wound people with words pretty easily. I know that's hard for you to believe. Could never say anything mean, except for behind the wheel. Just as a joke, I was thinking about wearing my helmet today, my motorcycle helmet, um, because Don and I have have this thing about riding our motorcycles. The nice part about the the full face shielded helmet is that when we get mad and we start yelling at people on the road, people just think we're listening to music. You can't see what's coming out of our mouths, so maybe this would be a good idea. I'm going to look at two texts this morning that connect. We're actually going to look at a number of texts, but two of them that connect specifically to this passage through Luke. Um, The first one, or or, um, through the Gospels, the first one is Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. You will not like this any more than I did. And I say, I I want you to understand something. I I had a serious wrestling match with God this week in in a, a super, super good way. But it was painful. It was painful for me. Um, because in the process of going through this text, God opened my eyes to some areas that I'm, I'm doing the balancing act of Christian, Christianity. 
And I had to give that up or I'd have to get up here and rip more pages out of my Bible. Right? Because if I'm going to read it and ignore it, I might as well take it out. Because what's the point of it, of, of it staying in there? If I'm not going to live in obedience to it, it, it just it's illogical. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 4 says this. And he said to his disciples, Temptation to sin, temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and he turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Wouldn't you guys like to pull out verse 4? If we're honest? Seriously. How many, what's, what's, your, what's your toleration limit of being sinned against? Three? probably pretty close. <laughs> Seriously, think about it. If, if somebody offends you once, I mean, some, you guys, I have a sub-zero standard on the freeway. Like, I'm mad at them before they do anything. <laughs> I start out in an attitude of unforgiveness. Seriously, how else do we respond to people so quickly? How do you go from zero to angry with one person cutting you off? This whole idea of forgiving people, even if they do, you know, seven times. We're going to go back and forgive them. And I love verse 3, pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to yourselves. This issue of causing others to stumble, of living in sin is a serious issue. God takes this seriously. And we're going to see that that is going to continue um, as we go through the text. In 1 Corinthians 8, uh, 8 through 13, Paul is challenging the believers to, to live their life in a way that recognizes the needs of the brothers that, they, that we interact with, that, that it, they can, it can, counting other people's uh, issues and their life issues and considering their weakness or how they might be stumbling in sin and to adjust our lives Accordingly, look at 1 Corinthians 8, 8 through 13. And he's talking about food offered to idols here, and that was, that was one of the huge cultural issues of the church at that time. In verse 8, he picks up and he says, Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ." Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Do you think Paul took this seriously? And tell you, honestly, in the selfishness of my own heart, there's been a number of things that I've thought, why should I, as a brother that's free of these things, be responsible for those who are weak? That, to me, that just seems unfair. And yet, Paul says that if we do this, if we live in such a way where our freedoms, our knowledge, our liberties causes a weaker brother to stumble, that we're sinning against Christ. And that's because we are the body of Christ. So when we wound one another, when we cheat one another, when we hurt one another, when we choose to live in sin uh, with, with amongst one another, we are wounding Jesus himself. And I love this illustration. Look at Matthew 18. Um, and I'm going to go on a, on a little tangent here. Somebody wrote a song about this, and I'd love to meet him in person and actually teach him contextual accuracy. 
and you'll see it in just a minute as I read through the text. And I apologize if I offend you with this. I've been trying to offend somebody at least once this year so I can get it over with and be done. So if this happens now, I, I feel like I've accomplished and I can relax. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I love that verse in verse 10, or was it 10? Oh yeah, this is one of the ones that's missing a verse, uh, missing a number for, for uh, several reasons. Um, for I tell you that in, in heaven, in verse 10, their angels always see the face of my Father. What do you think? How, how would you address that? How would you deal with that? Somebody's telling you that, it, that this little one, one of their angels... That's what we see in the text, is always seeing the face of the Father. They're always in His relationship, always in fellowship with Him, always in communication with Him. I honestly believe what He's saying is be very careful how you treat these people. Be very, very careful how you engage with them because they are valued by God. Their angels have direct and regular communication with the Father. They are protected. They are cared for. They are loved. They are valued. The song that drives me nuts is reckless. Because they imply that, that God leaving the 99 to go and rescue this one puts all, of, all the rest of them at, in danger. And that he, that he recklessly leaves them to go and save the one. And so because of that recklessness, the love for the one is so great. Well, that just violates the character of God, doesn't it? It also makes him a pretty poor shepherd. And we all know the text says he's the great shepherd. So, remember, even as you hear that song, that God is not reckless. He's intentional. His love is costly. But it's never reckless. And God is not reckless. He takes this seriously. And he cares for the lost, he cares for the weak, he cares for the, for the insignificant in our body, in the church. And he's aware of that, even today. The second point is, uh, today is taking sin seriously. And, and I, I know at, at this point, um, you just have to ask your, yourselves, did the disciples all go in did you hear about their, their ministry with no hands, no feet, no eyes? I mean, if they took Jesus seriously, you would think that there would be records of them missing limbs, or at least hands and feet, right? I mean, we have the record of their behavior right here in front of us. Peter denies Christ three times. They should have at least cut out his tongue. Would have saved him a lot of trouble. Right? I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but when you look at the text, our tendency is to think, ah, oh, do I really have to cut off my hand? Do I really have to cut, you know, gouge out my eye? Do I really have to go to this length? And, and I don't believe that what Jesus is illustrating here is, the, is actually doing this because we, don't, again, don't see the record of it. But I believe what he's trying to do is paint the seriousness of this situation. We live on this earth as if right now is what really matters, and we, re, we, we just ignore the, history, the, the, the reality of eternity. Somehow we think that living this moment in, this, in experiencing sin or doing whatever it is that we want to do is so much more important than reality, and, and I get it. Because I wrestle with this too. I, I look at my life and I think, man, I still have 50 good years maybe. Right? How many years do you have left?
Isn't it interesting as you age that changes? No, don't you find it interesting? Uh, I mean, Jerry's, Jerry and, and Dennis McDonough are such an encouragement to me. Because they testify regularly to how soon they're going to see Jesus. And it's not with fear. It's not with terror. It's with anticipation. As a young man, I thought I had a lot of time. As a mildly matured man, I realize I don't. We need to take sin seriously, and this is not a balancing act. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Paul's addressing the Corinthian church. They were a phenomenally mature body of believers. Had very little issues in their church. That's a sarcastic remark. In fact, there, I think there's a lot of our churches today that would look at them and think to themselves, man, we're doing so much better than the Corinthian church. We're better than them. Look at, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor gr the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul's identifying that in this church there are people who were these things. If you just take idolater, just you could throw out all the rest of them that seem really horrible and just take idolater. At some point, every one of us struggles with the idolatry of self. We do, or we'd never have a fight in our marriage. Think about it. If you came, just take the marriage relationship. If you came to marriage, died to yourself, and were there to only serve your spouse to death, like Ephesians says, how could you have a fight? You don't have an opinion. You don't have any rights. There is nothing to fight about. James chapter 1 says that the problem that we have, the reason we have conflict is because we don't get our own way, and so we murder one another. He goes to murder. I think because Jesus did in Matthew chapter 5, right? When we're angry with one another, we're guilty of murder. Paul says that some of us were this way. This is who we were before Christ. But he says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus. Sin is not a balancing act. This idea of walking with God is not a balancing act. It's not about us trying to keep track of how good we've been or how close to sin we are. In fact, the boggling of the mind for me was how often I actually am interested in how close to sin I am rather than looking at how close to God I am. How is that even a discussion in my life? How close can I get to this before I get dirty? I used to use the illustration of a wedding dress going into a mine when I was trying to teach kids in youth group about sin and how tainted we get when we're next to sin and we're around it and how it doesn't matter how careful you are. If you wear a white wedding gown down into a coal mine, you're going to get dirty, right? Right? Okay, there are people here just in case you're watching. It doesn't matter. You're going to be affected by being in that environment. We're going to have those things. And yet Paul's reminding the Corinthian believers they were in the midst of filth and, and, and idolatry and idol worship and sexual immorality and all of these things were part of their culture. And he's reminding them, but you were washed. You were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. That is our condition if we're his children. This is probably the one that was the most difficult for me all week. Revelations 21, verses 5 through 8. 
And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You know, part of what I wrestled with this week is at what point am I a liar in my life? At what point do I lie? You know, I have guys in my life that I, that I am accountable to, and one of the commitments that we've made is to never, ever lie. Ever. Doesn't matter how gross it is, doesn't matter how ugly it is, doesn't matter how, how embarrassing or shameful, or what it, we don't lie. Do you know how good that is for me? Do you know how horrible that is for me? One of the little jerks calls me up and says, Hey, how's you doing with this issue in your life? Shut up. Right? Now listen, we can't do that with everybody. I can, I, you guys can't be my accountability group because quite honestly, if you knew everything that was in my heart, you would never let me preach again. That's just the reality of it. I, I can't do that with all of you, but... All of us need to have people in our lives that we are that honest with sin about. I think one of the greatest dangers for us is that we actually get in the habit of lying about our sin. We show up to church and we cover it all up. We want to make sure we look good. and Everybody thinks we're doing good, right? Because Jesus people all praise Jesus no matter what's going on. Hey, how's your life? Well, I was in a fight with my wife today, but praise Jesus, I'm at church. Really? Is church what resolves that for you? Isn't it the power of God? Isn't it the presence of God? Isn't it, isn't it the practice of, of being engaged and close to Him? Not looking like we are good Christians, but actually pursuing the heart and the presence of God Himself. Romans 6, uh, 1 through 4 is, is what really reminds us of this particular issue. Paul says in Romans 6 verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He's making the argument that when we sin, God's grace is is plentiful and it shows up. So, more sin then? He says, no. No. No, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We might walk in newness of life. Yes, grace is amazing, and we're going to look at that in just a second. But we need to take sin seriously. This is not a balancing act. It's not about how close we can get. The Christian brother and sister who understands the depth of this runs from sin and runs to the Lord. I wish I could say that I've succeeded in this process. I have not. I, I have moments in my life, like I did this last week, where God said, you know, Shane, this is a great sermon that you're not enjoying preaching. But you still do this in a few areas. Now I've got them pretty polished up, because I've been a Christian for most of my life. So I, if there was a job title, uh, Sin Polisher... I would probably be. I th- it, it, didn't they? Didn't he use like a toilet back then? It was like a 
we could, could call it the porcelain throne polisher. But the reality is, is that until we see sin the way God does, you guys, we're going to keep running as close to it as we can. Because we like it. We like it. It's unfortunately, and many, many times, the desires of our heart is to live in sin. Look at what Romans says in Romans 2, 1 through 11. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourselves, because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God, God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who, who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey in righteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory and, uh, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the, the Greek. For God shows no partiality. That's the reality of sin. That's the, that's the stark, cold truth. And isn't it interesting that His kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. When God extends His grace, when we experience the grace, when, when our sin is there and we go back to Him and repent, that kindness is meant for us to lead us to repentance, not to license. Not to think that somehow it's okay to stand this close to sin because it's not. That's not the point. When he extends kindness to us, we're supposed to turn to him and see him for who he is and run to him because God does not show favoritism. We will be judged by Christ. And the things that we did in this life will be evaluated. That's what the scripture says. I love this text. It's one of those goofy ones where um, a couple of the manuscripts didn't actually have the Isaiah 66 reference that you see in there, that where the worm uh, will not die and the, the, the fire is not quenched. Um, in the, in the uh, um, commentary arguments over which text is correct, does this belong, uh, they've actually agreed that the most reliable passages about Mark have this reference in there, and so we're going to leave it in there and look at it. Actually, we're not even going to look at that particular reference because we have it right there. Um, but in the process of reviewing that, as I went back and reread Isaiah 66, this passage really grabbed my heart. Isaiah 66, verse 1 through 6. When we think about God not showing favoritism, what is he looking for? What is it that, that he's watching for? And we actually see this in Isaiah 66, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hands has made, and all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who presents a grain offering like one who offers pig's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of fragrance like one who blesses an idol. These have chosen their own ways. 
and their soul delights in their abominations. I also will choose harsh treatment for them and bring their fears upon them, because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen, but they did what was evil in my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. Hear the word of the Lord. You who tremble at his word, Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. But it is they who shall be put to shame. The sound of the uproar from the city and the sound of the temp from the temple, the the sound of the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. Did you see who he's looking for? Who he's going to look to in this time of judgment? It was those who are humble and contrite in spirit and tremble at his word. When was the last time that you opened the Bible with a little bit of a shudder? Because you were beginning to read the word of God. You know, one of the dangers of pastoring is that um, this can become just a tool. It's just, it's just a thing that, that I study and prepare inspirational speeches from. That was meant to be sarcastic, because I don't feel like we do that, and I hope we don't do that. But do we come to this and tremble? Because it's God's Word? The beauty in all of this, and, and I, I felt like we couldn't leave it at that, is that God provides the solution, right? Isn't that the beauty of the gospel, the good news? When we begin to see our sin as it really is, when we begin to recognize the depravity of our hearts, then God's grace and the good news becomes magnified. Not just a good thing, not just amazing, but magnificent, supernatural. Almost worth mentioning. I think the first part of God's provision is that we have to recognize our condition. Uh, Look with me, if you would, in James chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. I remember in verse four or chapter four, starting out in verse one, it's where he ca- he talks about what causes quarrels, what causes fights. It's it's the selfishness of our hearts. We we don't get what we want, and so we murder one another, and and, and that's what where he's at. And then through verses six and seven, he talks about God opposing the proud. Submit yourselves. And in verse eight, we pick up the text. He says, "Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you." Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Do you see that when we come near to God, when we draw near to him and we begin to see the wretchedness of our sin, James seems to think that we should be appalled, that we should be wretched and mourn and weep at the conditions of our heart, at the actions and the desires of our heart, it should cause us to weep. Isn't it funny that we have a virus running around town? And it's changing the way people live. It's changing how people live. A virus. And they're suggesting that we use soap and water for 20 seconds. 
Let that sink in for just a minute. A virus that absolutely, I mean, people are dying from it. It's serious. You guys, sin. Everybody's dying from it. Nobody gets out of this one alive. Nobody. Is it changing how you live? If it doesn't, then we don't see it the way God does. If it doesn't, then we don't understand the gospel. And it should cause us to weep and mourn. It should cause us to respond like Job did. I don't know how many of you have been reading Job 38 through 42, but I want to encourage you to keep doing that. A couple people have taken my challenge and they've been reading it uh, during the week for the last couple of weeks. And every now and then they call me and tell me how wonderful they think it is. I want to encourage you, if you haven't had a view of God recently that is out of this world, to go and open up Job chapter 38 through 42. Just go and see who this God is that we claim to be following, that we claim to love. And the beauty of this is that when we are here, when we have this view, when our lives actually come to the point that we recognize the depravity of our sin, when we recognize that we are incapable of meeting up the standards of God and coming into His presence on our own, that Ephesians 2, 8-10 through 10 shows up. And it says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He did not intend us to be a circus act, balancing sin and good deeds. He called us to a new life that He prepared in advance for us. Before the creation of time, his children were known by him and he created them for a purpose. And we end this picture in Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 is the great faith passage where it talks about all these the, the saints and, and people that have died by faith that were looking forward to life that God was promising and their obedience in the moments of great trial and suffering. And Hebrews chapter 12 starts with this, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us cast off every weight and sin which clings so closely to us. Do you take sin seriously? I don't know that we do. I don't know if we really, really do. I'm afraid that uh, I'm afraid that we all may have kind of accepted a lie that you're close enough. It'll be all right. His grace is enough. You you can keep running back to that sin. It's okay. Especially if we all look like we're Christians on Sunday. It's doubly okay. God seems to take this pretty serious. I want to encourage you this morning that if at any point in your life you see yourself asking the question, how close to sin can I get? That's nah, just who I am. I can't help it. 
Not as bad as others. I don't know, have you ever had this one? I'm better than my dad. You know, I, I lived that way for a long time. Honestly, I did in my marriage. My dad left when I was three, cheated with women constantly on my poor mom. Left my mom with three kids, one in the womb, two born, and walked away. And I used to think to myself, I'm better than him. Why can't my bride see that? We don't measure ourselves based on others. We don't, we don't choose to walk into sin based on what the world does. If we're His children, then we take His word and we tremble. And we bow our hearts. And we repent when we see sin in our lives. I know that we're going to struggle with this. I'm testifying. It's a struggle. It doesn't go away. Being a pastor does not make it better. I wish it did. Then I'd at least understand why he has me doing this. Unfortunately, being at church every week doesn't really make it any better. Although it helps because you're hanging out with other people that are screwed up too, and they can encourage you. We need to do some real business with the Lord. I think all of us need to do some real business with the Lord. And we need to take this seriously. and Stop playing games. Stop tempting. Stop, stop treating this like it's bad food. Isn't it funny? You know, a, a virus changes how people live. We know that soda kills us. We all know it. It's horrible. We shouldn't be drinking it. Yeah, how many of you have a pile of it at home? What? I'm the only one. Thank you. One honest other person. That is awesome. Two. Man, God is moving. It's time to take this seriously. It is time to take it seriously. You don't know if you're going home to see Him today. You don't know if you're going to stand before the judgment throne of God today. Why would you wait? If you believe that this is true, why would you wait? It is just crazy. Crazy. Would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? Father, I feel like I'm rambling, and yet at the same time, God, it's the burden of my heart. I don't want to live this way. I don't want to be a liar. I don't want to live as close to sin as I can get. And yet, God, it is the, it's the inclination of my heart at times. And the goofiest part is I'm going to do this and I'm going to confess all this stuff and make a commitment with my brothers and sisters and then tomorrow morning I'm going to probably wake up with a bad attitude. Because that happens, and I get on the freeway and I find myself getting angry with people for no good reason. I go right back to having to confess. But Father, right now I want to testify that I, I know that you're beyond me. I know that your holiness and your righteousness is incapable of me achieving that on my own. That my only right response before you is to fall on my face before you on the ground and to beg for mercy. Because I'm a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips, as Isaiah says. And our only response is to cry out and say, Lord, please forgive. Forgive me for being an idolater, for being selfish and self-focused. Forgive me for living as close to sin as I can, somehow defining it my, uh, my own boundaries. Forgive me for not trembling at your word. God, I pray this week as we engage in life that your spirit would overwhelm us 
when we engage in sin, when we choose sin over you, when we look to see how close we can get, God, I pray that you would break our hearts. If there's anyone this morning, I'm not going to have you stand up or do anything. If there's anyone this morning that needs to start today to surrender your heart to God, I want to encourage you that God is able to interpret whatever comes out of your mouth because He knows your heart. But if it would be helpful, you can repeat quietly in your heart after me. Lord Jesus, I can see that I'm a sinner and I acknowledge that I am. And Lord, I need your forgiveness and I need your answer, your good news to someday be in the presence of this God of the Bible, my Father. Lord, would you take the desire of my flesh today and put it to death as you did on the cross and raise me in new life through Jesus Christ that I would be your child and that I would be aware of and sensitive to and led by the Spirit to repent and confess sin that I see and to seek you, Lord, to draw near to you, that you would change my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you're doing. Transform our hearts this week in your name. Amen. Let the Word of God change how you live this week. Let the Word of God change how you live this week.